Hey, this is Artie Cabral. This is Sarah Nofke. This is Stefan Boltz. This is S. Elliot Brandis, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woohoo! Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Our guest today is Samuel Peralta. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and uh, joining us for 30 Minute Author Interviews. Thanks for inviting me, Preston. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. I've uh, I've been real excited since I marked it on the calendar. So um, we're starting something new with the with the podcast. Uh, uh, a new segment we're opening with called Two Truths and a Lie." So you have two truths and a lie prepared for me, and I'm going to see con- how bad I am uh, at this. So <laughs> we'll see if my losing streak continues, or if I can pick up a win with yours. <laughs> Okay, then. Well, here we go. All right. Uh, Number one, in the mid-70s, I was involved in the Antares rocket project. Okay. Number two, I'm a collector of Cubist art and have an original Picasso. Number three, I was associate producer on a Golden Globe-nominated film. Two truths and a lie. Wow, those are hard. (laughs) (laughs) I have a feeling I'm going to get this one wrong. Let's see. I'm trying to think of past interviews I've heard you on and what I know. Um, I think number three is going to be a truth, so I'm down to number one or number two. Um, I'm going to say number two is the lie. That's your choice? That's my choice, number two. You got it. Did I? Okay. I was thinking I could see you being an art collector, but I don't know about a Picasso. So good for you. Good Good for you. (laughs) In the mid seventies, I was involved in the Antares rocket project. Okay. Uh, The, uh, the big rocket project, Antares project was in the uh, 2013s about, uh, but in the seventies, I was, uh, I, I did model rocketry and the Antares rocket was an STs model rocket that I built for for flying. Okay. Uh, The Golden Globe-nominated film that I was uh, an associate producer on was The Fencer. And uh, it was a... uh, it was a. It was uh, nominated uh, for best foreign film. It was also shortlisted for an Oscar. It didn't win either of them, but it was never, nevertheless a, a thrill to be uh, to be involved with that. And I am. Uh, I do get involved a lot with uh, independent film. Uh, I started out on uh, Kickstarters, but then uh, as uh, my uh, uh, my uh, Rolodex started getting bigger and people started to know me. I started to get uh, invitations to uh, to uh, help on uh, on uh, films on my own. So that's become another aspect of me uh, wanting to help creatives make their visions come true. So I, I derive a lot of satisfaction in that, actually. That is uh, – that's interesting. And uh, you're right. I am a I am an art collector. I don't collect cubist art. I actually collect uh, uh, what I call magic realism, which is essentially a very realistic art, but which has a narrative behind uh, the 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 art. So it's art that tells a story in that one photograph. So it's very is very uh, consistent with what I like to do in my poetry and my uh, short stories and my anthologies. Uh, I do appreciate art like Picasso. My ma- my mother is an artist herself. She she does abstract art, so I do appreciate art of all kinds, but my collection is is a little bit more more narrow because I find that if you if you focus on a spe- on a certain subject and area, you're able to put to co- together a collection that's a little bit more cohesive. So there you are. You got the right one. So what what's one of your favorite uh, pieces of art that you have um, in your or that you own? Hmm. Uh, let me see that. And what's the story behind it, or what what's the story that it tells? I've I have a piece of art. I've got the a lithograph uh, by Alex Colville. He's an he's a Canadian uh, artist, and it's a, a lithograph of a girl running 
in mid-flight running after this bus in the background, and it's called Berlin Bus. And you have no idea why she's uh, running after the bus. Uh, I got this at an auction, actually. It was it was quite interesting because I got it from an auction that was online from a German art house. So the entire auction was being streamed online in German. And I luckily there was a uh, there was a uh, function for clicking and translating the whole stream into English. They had simultaneous translation, and to our surprise, we won. Nice. So. So the so the the, the piece of art is uh, is essentially making you wonder why is this girl running after the bus, and it lets the viewer actually make up the story. Did she leave her handbag bag on the bus? Is there a person on the bus that she's trying to go after? Is what it, is the uh, action of the girl running not? Not really connected to the bus at all, but it's just the juxtaposition of the two images, and it's the creation of that story that's partially the uh, the interest of that uh, of that piece of work. Very interesting. So, are all the art pieces like that uh, that you make up the story that goes with it, or do some of them actually have? their own specific story there there actually are probably stories behind the the work uh but but the viewer usually isn't uh intimate with them the the the, the artist has created a uh, a, a painting, a lithograph, a piece of art where the uh, the people in it are it interacting. There is an emotional uh, subtext within the story, but the viewer doesn't really know that. The viewer has to try to figure out from their own experience, project their own imagination onto the onto the onto the painting. Uh, so we have, for example, a woman who's in a canoe with a dog, and you don't know why is the woman there with the dog. Is she going away? Is she coming back? Is she happy? Is she sad? Why is there an absence of a man there? We don't know. We don't know the story. But the fact is that the, the artist has chosen a woman and a dog, and they're not on a in a car. They're not in a house. They're on a canoe in the middle of the river. And you have to figure why that is. Uh, it we have a we have a, a girl on a horse um, that's riding uh, away from us, and she's looking back slightly. And what she's looking back is a very large iron cross that's set like a monument uh, in the earth. And the question is, what is that iron cross? What is the girl looking back at it for? Surely she has passed this way before. Does she know what the story of that uh, Iron Cross uh, is about? Uh, what is she thinking as she passes by this cross? Does the horse even mind that its rider has turned? These are the questions that you can uh, that you can bring to bear from a uh, from a f uh, with a picture like that. That is awesome. Um, so for those that might not know who you are or what you do, uh, can you kind of tell people who you are and what you do? Well, I'm a, I, I always like to say I'm a physicist and a storyteller. Uh, my day job and what I, what I uh, took in university and post uh, graduate work uh, was actually physics, so I do have a PhD in physics, and I work in a uh, uh, in a nuclear company. But I also do startups, uh, essentially in high technology. Uh, and as a storyteller, I feel that that part encompasses my work in poetry, uh, my work in. Uh, art collecting, my work in supporting independent film, uh, and in writing uh, short stories. But I guess I'm most known for The Future Chronicles, which is a series uh, of anthologies that collect short stories in the genre of uh, speculative fiction, that's science fiction and fantasy. I started out uh, a couple of years ago with uh, one anthology, and it basically took off. So as of now, we've got 18 individual titles, all of which have become uh, 
best-selling titles on Amazon, many number ones there, uh, not just in science fiction, but also in fantasy, horror. And recently, we hit number one in cyberpunk with our latest title. And uh, some of them have gone on to become uh, uh, the top 10 in uh, all over Amazon, not just in science fiction, but in the general uh, in the general uh, uh, books listing. So it's been a it's been an amazing project. I've gotten to work with over 200 authors. Some of them are household names, people like Robert J. Sawyer, uh, Ken Liu, Julie Cerneda, uh, Hugh Howey, but also a lot of new authors, you know, authors who are starting out or, or, or just in, the, in uh, beginning their careers, just like myself, but who I thought had voices that uh, had to be heard. They had ideas that were just expressed so well or, or that were so different that I thought of them as the leading edge of the silver age of science fiction, a new silver age. So one of the goals of the uh, Future Chronicles has been to spotlight these authors uh, and bring them an audience where previously they may have had difficulty finding one. So that's been that's been my uh, uh, my work for the past two years uh, in uh, in this area, and I'm very pleased and proud to be still doing it. Before we talk about the future chronicles more, um, I want to ask you about one of the stories you've written that is, I, I want to say it's my favorite story you've written, and it's called Hereafter. Um, where uh, where did that story idea come from? And for those that haven't read it, can you also give them kind of a little book blurb on what that's about? Well, Hereafter is a uh, time travel story. Actually, it's subtitled a, uh, a story of love and time travel, and that's exactly what it is. And uh, the blurb is, uh, and I'll bring it bring bring it up on Amazon here, so I can see exactly what the blurb says. But uh, it's about uh, a woman and a man in their relationship, and uh, the the woman is Corporal Caitlin McAdams, uh, who is in the uh, who's um, stationed in Afghanistan, and she returns home from war, um, back to the family and the life she knew. But she doesn't return quite whole, because apart from the uh, the war, she also left someone behind, a man that she'd met once before, uh, by chance in a dock, and felt an attraction for, and who reappeared in Afghanistan. But before they could do anything, he died, the casualty of a roadside bomb. But the one day, he comes back. And that's essentially the setup for the story. And it is a short story. A lot of people have said there, there, should, be a, there should be more to it than that, but it is a short story. And uh, how it began was there was, a, uh, there was a time travel anthology being put together by uh, David Gatewood and Michael Bunker. And this was uh, the, the anthology called Synchronic. And at the time, I was just beginning – uh, to be uh, to 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 write in the speculative uh, fiction air uh, genre, and what I'd done uh, was I'd written a one thousand word spec story. It's a story that that served as a calling card, if you like, called Trauma Room, and I presented it and I said, if you still have room for uh, another time travel story. This is the kind of work that I can bring to bear on it. And Trauma Room, again, was a thousand-word short story that I tried to put, pour all of my writer's craft into. It eventually got placed in another anthology, but what happened was on the strength of that spec story, I was commissioned to do a story for this anthology, Synchronic. So I began a story, and the story that I began was a time travel story that I that began as something I called the Hereafter War. And I may one day write that story, but the Hereafter War was a story about war. 
it focused on war and what it what would happen was that in the future my concept was in the future uh the armies were so depleted that they had to find soldiers from another era so they were bringing soldiers into the future to fight that war and they were taking them from the wars that already existed in the past including afghanistan and that was the basis of the time travel story that I was writing. And it just was not working. It just wasn't working for one reason or another. And then, but we, had, but there was one character in there uh, whose story was interesting. It was Corporal Caitlin McAdams. Uh, who been, and she basically, the character, turned to me and said, tell my story, tell my story, work on my story. So I took her and I eventually wrote the story around this very strong character. And that was uh, what turned out into Hereafter. It was no longer a war story, although there were aspects of war in it, but it became a love story. And that is, like I said, that's probably one of my favorite short stories you've written. Um, so if you haven't checked it out, you need to go definitely check that one out. It's it's also been uh, I've, I, it's also been uh, an, an amazing story for me because it was named uh, by Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy as one of their notable stories of 2015. It was picked by uh, it was recommended uh, to uh, to uh, uh, Great Jones Street, which is an app on Apple and Android for short stories. Uh, to be in their uh, in their premier uh, selection of short stories, uh, it was collected in Lightspeed magazine, nice. uh, and then and then I reprinted it again in the Time Travel Chronicle. So I got a lot of mileage out of that out of that short story. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> we have two uh, questions for you that. Uh, a couple that don't revolve around your your future chronicles that we'll go ahead and just knock out. The first one is from uh, Reba Kirby. She wants to know, will you please put your poetry all into one book? I am going to do that. The uh, so so uh, I've got five volumes of poetry at the moment, and they're they're all on sale on Amazon, and uh, all of them hit the number one hot new poetry uh, list. Uh, but one day, I guess I I will put put them all down in one book. I don't know when that will be. It'll probably be. My best guess is it'll happen in 2017. Okay. What what draws you to writing poetry? Poetry was uh, my first love, really. I mean, I, I've got a, uh, I've got poetry that was written when I was, uh, gosh, uh, six, seven, eight years old. That was collected by my mom. When I first started writing, I, I, I began writing. I be, I loved rhymes, so all of that. That poetry in the early years was rhyming poetry, and up to now, I still do love structure in terms of uh, sonnets and rhyme and uh, meter, and uh, it just feels very natural to me because I've been writing it for so long. It's also a, a chance to hone your craft and be able to distill your words in the your 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 feelings and thoughts and narrative in as few words as possible so it's a very strong uh it's 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 like exercising your literary muscles when you're when you're writing poetry do you find it harder to write poetry or to write uh your short stories i find them both uh, equally difficult to write. I'm, I'm one of those who who work very hard at my at my writing. Uh, I do believe in inspiration, but I also believe that uh, that a, uh, a writer is a craftsman. So they're 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 both equally difficult. They're just difficult in in different ways. Okay. Um, Patricia Gilliam would like to know what is your next personal project. 
my next personal project. My next personal project is to complete my first novel. I've been saying this for the last how many years, and I've <laughs> never, never hit it yet. So I've got a chance to now. I'm part of a box set uh, that's that's going to be releasing next year called Dominion Rising, and so I've promised them that I'm going to be finishing a uh, finishing a novel for that now. I also, on the basis of the strength of my anthologies, have had a bite from uh, a traditional publishing uh, uh, house. Uh, an imprint of one of the large publishing houses actually approached me and said if I had a novel in, in the works, and would they, would they be able to see it? And so I said, of course I did. And I did have a novel in the works, but that is not yet complete. And I'm hoping that either the Dominion Rising box set or this uh, this uh, query from the traditional publisher, that one of those is going to finally let me allow me to finish the uh, the the novel. That is very awesome. Um, so let's jump into the future chronicles, since that's kind of what you're you're known for. Um, why did why did you start the future chronicles what was the the inspiration behind starting that well i didn't since i had a day job and i was working in several, in you know uh, on the board of directors of a couple of startups i didn't really have a lot of time to write a novel uh so there were there were uh uh, most people said that to make it in the business, you had to write novels. And that's still true today. Uh, but I only had time to write short stories. And so, and also that was my forte simply because I was writing poetry up until then. And so that was a short form. And I didn't have the chops to write to the, the long form. I, and so short stories were, were, were a natural. The question was then, what what would I do in order to to uh, to find an audience with the short stories? Uh, and one of the and the answer was essentially to create an anthology around the short story. If I could, for example, take my short story and convince other people to contribute. Uh, short stories to a project, I could collect uh, maybe a dozen of these short stories into one anthology and then sell that. And that would be something that uh, readers would pay for. I had the next idea that, gosh, I wouldn't publish just one, I'd publish two. And the reason for that was the novel that I was planning at that moment had robots in it, and it also had telepaths in it. So I said I would publish, I, I, I definitely would publish two anthologies, the Robot Chronicles and the Telepath Chronicles. The Robot Chronicles would have a story in there that would be that would link into the novel, and the Telepath Chronicles would also have a story to link into my novel. So the idea was that uh, if you've read my stories in both of those, then you would naturally want to seek out the novel. Unfortunately, the, no the novel never got written. <laughs> in Instead, there was a third book, the Alien Chronicles, and I didn't have any aliens in my in in my planned novel. And there was a fourth one, and it just kept on going because uh, people loved the Chronicles, and that's what they wanted. And after that, I didn't have any more time to continue work on the novel. Yeah, they were. They just. I remember when you first started, and it it, it was Robot Chronicles. It was the first one, right? That's correct. Yeah. It, I mean. It just seemed each one got bigger and bigger and more popular and more popular and more popular. And now it's just, it's its own beast. Um, how do you go about finding the authors that you want to put inside of these chronicles? Well, the uh, the authors that I put are all authors who've written things that I love. So, uh, so, so really these are, these are stories where, uh, these are anthologies where I already know the authors because I've read uh, either their books or some of their other short stories or a couple of chapters of their books. And then I think, gosh, I would like to have one of their stories in my anthology. So most of this is by invitation. 
Uh, some of them are by nomination. You people nominate other authors, and then I look into them, and I buy their books, and I have a read, and I think, would that person fit in with, with the anthology series? And if they do, then then I ask them. Some people decline. They don't have time. Uh, but uh, a lot more people now uh, seek out to be an author on the Future Chronicles than not. But it's mainly people whose stories I do like. Okay. Um, this one might be a little tough. It's probably like choosing a, a favorite kid. But um, ha- has there been any certain author that has been nominated by other people that their work just really stands out to you and you're not sure if you would have discovered them any other way? Oh, yeah. Michael Holden was one author who I would never have discovered any other way uh, because he was writing in a, in in a, uh, he was writing about real history uh, and I and he was nominated by uh, uh, Wes, Wesley Davis okay and basically he he said you've you've got to read this because he wrote a story called uh the red mustang and the red mustang was a time travel story now i would never have come across uh uh michael holden unfortunately he's not a science fiction writer uh and so i agonize over whether i should include him in because i i like to include authors who already have uh who have a body of work so that if a reader likes that story, likes the author's style, then they can move on to uh, to to other uh, to other uh, works that he's written. And Michael Holden only had 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 work in other genres, but the Red Mustang, the story was so good that I thought I cannot pass this up. I have to include it in the book, and so I did. And without without that nomination, I would never have stumbled across him. Most of the other authors I probably would have stumbled over because they were already writing in the speculative uh, fiction genre. So although I there are people who are relatively unknown but who are who are really good, I probably would have stumbled uh, across them sooner or later. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Wesley Davis, as you said, he was in the Robot Chronicles and did Empathy for Ed, uh, Empathy for Andrew. And that is that is probably one of my favorite short stories that has been put out in any of your your chronicles. It still to this day sticks out to me. He is an excellent writer, an excellent writer, although he's now focusing, I think, on script writing. Yeah, he uh, he just got done doing a big project uh, with another guy. Um, I had him on. Pod- That's right. Podcast earlier, and it's kind of uh, uh, the American Revolution in space. So they just they just got done releasing that. So I think they're seeing how well that one goes. So yeah, um, great story. If they haven't checked that one out either, um, Drew Avery would like to know. <laughs> and this might be another tough one for you. Which future chronicle title is your favorite? That's an easy one, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's it's the one that I'm working on at the moment. Okay. It's it's whatever future chronicles title I'm working on. It's because I've got to, in order to do the best that I can on an anthology, I've got to focus on it, and I and, and then and once I read the stories again, finally in their anthology order, in the in the right way, and when everything clicks, then I've got an anthology that I like. It becomes my favorite. <laughs> there we go. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, Gareth Foy would like to know, he says, I don't know if he has done this already, but Samuel writes great science fiction, poetry, and produces brilliant anthologies. Is there a way to combine all three of these? Because that would be cool. Well, uh, someone's already beat me to that, eh? The uh, ac- actually, I appear in a uh, in an anthology series called "The Tales from the Canyons of the Damned." Okay, it's uh, it's uh, produced by Daniel Smith, who's also a Chronicle alumnus, and uh, in the latest issue, the Halloween issue, uh, he's collected one of my. Uh, uh, poems, uh, Sonata Vampirica, along with the, with with a couple of speculative fiction stories. So it's uh, is it, I was quite uh, amazed that 
uh, of that uh, with that idea, and he's planned to to make it a recurring theme in future uh, issues of his uh, of his. Uh, uh, electronic magazine, so so that's quite amazing for me, uh, and I think it is cool what 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 he's done because basically he's uh, he's taken the old pulp magazines which did include poetry, uh, and he's brought it into the modern day. And my uh, my uh, my feature there, Sonata Vampirica, as you know, is poetry, but it also is fantasy because it centers around vampires. And uh, that poem, which is actually 15 sonnets and a prelude, was also written, uh, the, the story behind it is also written because it was written under the instigation of a New York Times bestselling author, um, Ellen Hopkins. She writes, poet, uh, she writes novels in verse form. And uh, one day we were talking online, and we were talking about uh, we were talking about Twilight. If you remember, Twilight is the series that was put together by Stephanie Meyer, and uh, we were talking about that, and we were talking about Anne Rice and her vampire novels. And uh, Ellen said, "Sam, show them how to do it," <laughs> and and so I did. I, I took that as a challenge, and and I and I and I wrote this poem, and it's a dialogue in sonnet form between a vampire and his victim, and the vampire the vampires uh, the vampire sonnets are all in classical sonnet format, with uh, and and they and they all revolve around the seven deadly sins, and the victim sonnets are all free verse sonnets and they're all responses to the previous sonnet by the vampire and i thought uh, by by using this structure i could show the difference between the two and i could yet sh- and i could show how i could write a coherent story using a very strict form and so it was a personal challenge and i'm quite happy with uh how it turned out that is awesome. I haven't gotten to it yet. I'm a few volumes behind, but I definitely can't wait to get to it. Um, the final fan question comes from uh, Tim Ward, and he wants to know which story from the Immortality Chronicles has the most revolutionary <laughs> idea for immortality technology and what would have to happen for it to become reality? This is a trick question again because it would have to it would uh, it would make me choose between you know uh, among a, a dozen stories that I really really love and and I'm really bad at at uh, at choosing but I'll tell you something though uh, all of these all of these uh, stories have uh, have uh, Technologies in them that could very well be the one that leads to practical immortality. And at this point in time, there is no way of choosing one that will work. However, I do have a have an answer in that uh, for me, true immortality consists of being known down into the future. Shakespeare is immortal because his works continue to speak to us to this day. So I feel that all the authors in having written stories that may be read in the future have guaranteed themselves a piece of immortality that may be more lasting than biological immortality. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and then uh, one more fan question um, comes from Terry Maggart, and he says, has the intersection of science and speculative fiction grown closer and more distant in, in light of independent publishing? I think the answer is both. I think that uh, that uh, when when you when you have independent publishing, it opens the gateways uh, for writers of all backgrounds to write and to publish. And what that means is that you've got people uh, who work in NASA, for example, who are very who are very well versed in uh, hard science, to be able to uh, sit and write down. Uh, the books that they want to write that are based on their backgrounds. Uh, 
On the other hand, it also allows someone uh, somewhere isolated on an island somewhere to imagine uh, alien civilizations and and future societies that may not have anything to do with uh, hard science at all. So independent publishing rather than pushing one or the other, I think opens the doors uh, to making, uh, making that correspondence either closer or, or uh, further between science and speculative fiction. You said earlier that, that, that you like to do the Kickstarters and stuff to help, to help people and, and their craft. Um, what is it about that? Or why do you like doing that, especially with the the future chronicles, instead of focusing more on your work? I suppose it's because uh, it's because there's a lot of uh, of uh, joy to be gotten when you when you uh, when you inspire other other people. Um, there's a quotation by Gandhi, and I'm going to misquote this. Uh, but he says something like, uh, the best way is to lose yourself in the service of others. And I, and I truly believe that. I think one of the reasons that the Future Chronicles has been successful is that we truly want to spotlight authors who need to be spotlighted we have we i'm i'm not in it uh primarily to to earn a revenue i'm lucky in that my job and my circumstance allow me to do this because anthologies are actually a very expensive proposition the return on investment for an anthology is much much lower than if you would write your own uh novel but the joy of seeing a writer have their story published and getting their first paycheck and then celebrating with the, with their families upon getting their fa- paycheck and, lear- and and knowing that their story, what they'd written was good enough for someone, that someone other than their wife or mother or father or brother told them that their their writing was good, that's incomparable. You, you, you cannot put a price on that. And it's the same way with the, uh, with the uh, filmmakers that I help out on, uh, on uh, Indiegogo or Kickstarter or independently. Essentially, what I'm telling them when I contribute to them is I believe in you. There is somebody who believes in you. And I'm, I may be one of 50 or 100 or 10 or whatever, but at least I'm part of that voice telling them, I believe in you. You do great work go and so that's one of the things i say you need to you need to make your light shine because you you have a gift uh, that may be given you by god and you have an obligation to let that light shine into the world the other thing that i tell people is pay it forward because if i've helped you in some way don't worry about paying it back to me. Pay it forward. So I look at it as a multiplier. If I can help 200 people, uh, we've got 200 authors in, in the, uh, fi- uh, who are actively writing or have written in the Future Chronicles. And if I can help 100 filmmakers and each one of them pays it forward, then gosh, just think about the good that we can do in the world. Which one of your Future Chronicle titles has been – the uh, the best seller to date. What what's been the one that sold the best? Uh, right now, the uh, the big seller is the Future Chronicle Special Edition. Okay, that 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 is the one that has uh, has been uh, been very very successful. And uh, one of the reasons may be that people view it as a sampler of everything that's to come because it does sample from different future chronicles. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so, so that, that has been quite popular. 
of the themed ones, the, the two most popular ones are the AI Chronicles and the AI and the Alien Chronicles. Uh, those ones have been have really been very successful, and they probably uh, it, it's probably because they outline the uh, uh, two of the big themes uh, of modern science fiction: aliens and AI. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that, and so they're 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 very well received. What's next for the future chronicles? What's what's coming up next? Well, we've got uh, over a dozen uh, titles that are planned, but the one that's coming up next is a title that's called the Jurassic Chronicles, and the Jurassic Chronicles, as as you may guess, is a uh, is a title that's centered around the time when dinosaurs ruled the Earth. It won't strictly be the Jurassic period. Uh, but it's going to have that uh, that that sense. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, I've got uh, I've got uh, Victor Milan on that one. Uh, he's he's written uh, the Dinosaur Lords, which is out uh, in bookshelves right now. Which George R R Martin has uh, himself said is an amazing blend of uh, the Game of Thrones and Jurassic Park. Hmm. I've got uh, Shannon McGuire on that as well. I've got uh, oh god. There's a, a whole slew of USA Today best-selling authors on it, and uh, definitely some new authors that I think that people are going to enjoy. That's that's what's coming up immediately after, uh, and right after that, I'm going to be releasing the Illustrated Robot which is a return to the roots, if you like, of the Robot Chronicles, except that it's going to it, – it takes its inspiration a little bit from Ray Bradbury's The Illustrated Man. There will be a narrative that links all of the stories together, and there will be some illustrations in it as well. So those are the two immediate ones that are coming out, and I'm excited about them as well as some of the, uh, uh, the other dozen that, that, that I've already got planned. I was going to ask you when the uh, illustrated one was coming out because I know it's been worked on for a while. So it's it, it's right after Jurassic. That's the plan. Sounds good. You've you've almost been releasing almost one per month. Do you plan on keeping that schedule uh, that schedule with the Future Chronicles? We've slowed down a bit. Uh, it's now l- lately. It's been more like. Uh, uh, a book every one and a half months, but it really is a, it's a really f- rapid pace yeah. uh, in, in, in this world, even, even then. So it, it is a little bit wearing. Uh, as I reach the end of the, the 12 that are planned, I, I plan to be slowing down a lot. And that's for practical reasons. I, 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 I do want to get my teeth into finishing my novels and uh, jumpstart my career as a novelist. There are a lot of ideas in my head that I haven't written down and I'd like to get to. And I need to find the time to do that. And the only way to do that is to essentially slow down the, uh, the Chronicles output. Gotcha. And you have also with uh, still kind of in the same world, you've done um, alt chronicles. Uh, you featured uh, stories in other authors worlds like Legacy Fleet. I know there's a Hugh Howie one coming up. Um, what what other worlds are y'all looking at maybe exploring in these Chronicle world stories? Well, up. Uh- Upcoming, we've got, uh, as you said, we've got uh, uh, we've got a double feature for uh, Hugh Howey's Wool, which was one of the books that essentially got me interested again in the science fiction genre. And we've got uh, uh, roughly a couple of dozen authors who are going to be putting uh, out stories that will contribute towards a two-volume uh, Wool Chronicles, if you like. One is going to be uh, – uh, and we'll see where that goes. So that's going to be very exciting. Before that, I've got – I uh, have uh, – Chronicle Worlds Halfway Home, which is actually going to be in another of Hugh Howey's worlds, the world of Halfway Home. Uh, we've got uh, Faye Guard, which is the second world from uh, USA Today bestselling author Anthea Sharp. I've got a couple of more titles in uh, the Legacy Fleet world uh, that was uh, – pioneered by Nick Webb. Next one coming up is Legacy Warrior. And the next one will be Swarm War. And I've got uh, 
uh, Drifting Isle, which is a uh, another open source world, very much like the uh, Paradisi open source world that was the uh, genesis of Chronicle Worlds Paradisi. So there's there's there are well, I'm just uh, rolling that off, and I'm getting exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> But uh, B movie is another one uh, that's coming up. Uh, that was uh, that's uh, a collaboration between myself and Artie Cabrera, and the latest one that I announced is uh, Chronicle Worlds: Tales of Dystopia. Uh, you may recognize that as being similar to uh, the Tales of the Apocalypse that was put out by uh, Chris Porto uh, a year or so back. And that's because it is a collaboration between myself and Chris. We're going to set set a uh, chronicle in in uh, with using the concept that he pioneered, which was from the animals' point of view. So yeah, very exciting, very exciting, awesome. And uh, you mentioned Chronicle Worlds uh, Paradisi. Can you uh, just uh, and that's the latest one that's come out? Can you uh, let people know kind of what that one involves? Well. Paradisi was actually uh, it's it's quite interesting because the Paradisi project was a uh, project that was uh, that was sparked by a comment by Hugh Howey. Uh, what would happen if a shared world uh, spawned a dozen novels by authors all at the same time? So a uh, few authors got together and created this world, and they released uh, a set of novels, about a half dozen of them or so, uh, a few months ago, uh, which which I thought, wow, that's a very interesting concept. So I floated the uh, idea of taking that uh, that world and – putting an anthology together where I'd have about a dozen stories again that would be based on aspects of that world. Uh, that world is uh, – so that open source world uh, looks to a time when in the 21st century, uh, several families escape an earth that has been devastated and they colonize a world they call New Eden, which is an earth-like world in the Paradisi system, which is where the uh, Paradisi name comes from. Unfortunately, the world they claim for their own is already inhabited uh, by a species, although looking very human, possess abilities that are very different from humans. So it's an interesting concept, and that has just come out. And that uh, recently hit uh, number one on the best-selling science fiction anthologies uh, list on Amazon, as well as number one in cyberpunk. So we're very proud of that. Very nice. Well, here at the Legendarium, we like to end each episode uh, in a segment that we call the Legendary Ending. (laughs) Now, these questions are uh, kind of book-related, but not really. Um, so the first question is, what songs are currently on your writing playlist? Wow. <laughs> um, there's a, there's the, the, uh, I, I have playlists for different, for different books. Okay. And one, one of my playlists is the, uh, is the theme from somewhere in time. Uh, I don't know if you know it. Mm-mm. Uh, but but somewhere in time was a uh, was a movie that starred uh, Christopher Reeve and uh, Jane Seymour. And uh, if you haven't watched the movie, you'd love it. Actually, it's a date movie, so watch it with your wife. Bring a lot of Kleenex. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it is it is one of the it is one of the uh, one of the uh, inspirations for Hereafter. And so I play that theme song when I want to get into the mood to begin writing uh, the the novel that might be based on hereafter. That's that's one of, one of the things on my playlist. Uh, and then I have a a theme song. I can't remember the name of it now, but it comes from Conan the Barbarian. Mm-hmm. Conan the Barbarian is an early is a uh, what was it a '90s movie that starred uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger mm-hmm. as uh, and uh, that is uh, that is the theme song that I play when I'm trying to put together war stories or space opera and the third uh, 
theme song, if you like, is something from Vangelis. It's the theme song to Blade Runner. And uh, I play that when I'm trying to get in the mood for my noir detective thriller that I'm trying to write as well. So those are the three that I that that I listen to. Sounds good. If you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, which one of your book characters would you want to be stuck with and why? Oh wow! <laughs> I w- I think I, w- I don't have a lot of uh, I don't have a lot of characters because I've only written short stories. But I'd like to be with Sparrow from Faster okay. uh, because she is fast, as you can know. So she would be she was she would be someone to have you to have your back in 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 that kind of a situation. Although it might be difficult because her speed is uh, I don't know if you've read Faster. I believe but, I have. Uh, but uh, her her power is based on the fact that she can read people's minds and then act faster than the thought can reach the muscles of the person doing the action. She can react much faster than that. The problem, I guess, in a zombie apocalypse is they would they don't have minds, do right. they? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Gosh. So I, I guess I'm screwed. <laughs> Um, now, if you could be stuck in a zombie apocalypse with any character from any media source, comics, books, movies, uh, whatever, who would you pick and why? Oh, that's different. Thanks. I will. <laughs> I'll take. I'll take Superman. <laughs> take Superman. There we yeah, go. he'll he'll circle the world and make time go backwards until the time when there is no zombie apocalypse. There we go. That works. <laughs> um, if you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? Ah, that's that's interesting. Uh, I, I've thought ab- uh, about that a bit, and uh, sometimes you think maybe I'll go back to my boyhood when things were so ideal, and uh, maybe I'd go to the future. I'd check out to see how I was doing, or maybe I'd travel to the past to see a loved one that I miss. But to tell you the truth, I think if I had a time machine and I had the power to go back through time or forward through time, I wouldn't. I'm pretty happy where I am right now. There you go. I think you're the second person to say that, so it's a, it's a rare answer to get. Um, I'm going to ask you one I haven't asked an author in a while. Uh, if you could pick one genre to read for the rest of your life, which what genre would you read and why? Oh, wow. Just one? Just one. <laughs> well... <laughs> I'll say speculative fiction then, because that covers science fiction and fantasy, and it covers a whole lot of other things as well. So, can I do that? <laughs> that works. <laughs> that works. That works. Um, and if you could have one superpower, what would it be, and why? That's tough. That that is a tough one. If you're thinking, if you're thinking about things seriously, um, with all the events that are happening in the world right now, maybe. To turn back time, okay. That you know that to 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 and and I don't know what what to, but 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 perhaps that. Okay. And then uh, the question we're kind of famous for here: A penguin walks through that door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say, and why is he here? Ah, the penguin, <laughs> <laughs> Admiral Peralta. Your starship, the Millennium Penguin. She is ready for launch. Sounds good. And before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, Well, I like to think that the best is still to come. But the message I like to give is you have a light. Let your light shine and pay it forward. Sounds good. Where can our listeners go if they want to learn more about you or your stories or the Future Chronicles? Well, the best way right now, because I've never had the time to to set my author website right, is to go to Amazon, search for Samuel Peralta, and there I am. Best uh, list list it uh, linked to me, linked to the books, and uh, you can discover a whole world of other authors through my work. There we go. Well, we will put links to that in uh, the show notes over at legendarium.com. Great. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and doing uh, 30-minute author interviews. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Preston. It's been a pleasure. You you tri- tripped me up on a couple of things, but uh, 
that uh, it was it was enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, guys, that's all the time we've got for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to 30-Minute Author Interviews. We hope you come back next Wednesday and every Wednesday for a brand new episode. How would you like to win an ebook copy of any of the future Chronicle titles? Head on over to Legendarium.com and check out the show notes because Samuel Peralta is giving 18 people that chance. And one of the 18 people will win a signed copy of the Future Chronicles Special Edition. Good luck, everybody. And until next time, remember to stay legendary. And if you would, wait, wait, wait and subscribe. It weighs about 250.